A warm welcome to Sam. I, I have to confess, I, I broke my um, News UK duck uh, recently, and I was profiled in the in, in the Times. So I can I can no longer claim uh, make that claim anymore. I'm afraid, Michael. Sorry about sorry about that. I've lost my lefty lawyer con uh, credentials there. Um, I'd like to start this talk by, by perhaps talking about the what happened immediately after the prorogation case. Um, about four years and one month ago today, um, I was about to start my second year in practice. Um, we'd just done Miller, um, so I was feeling pretty cocky, if I'm honest. Um, and I was instructed in what remains one of the weirder cases of my career, um, because I was told to go and get an injunction against the Prime Minister. Um, and that's the only time in recent years that that sort of uh, instruction has, has actually been given, because, of course, while we JR various different government departments, sometimes we JR the, uh, the Prime Minister. I have twice. Um, it's very rare that the remedy you're looking for is an injunction. Um, but that's what I had to get in this case. And it flowed from an act of parliament called the Ben Act that Boris Johnson described as the Surrender Act. Um, it's got a much, much longer title um, that has to do with the uh, European Union brackets, etc., etc., number about 57 bill. Um, what that act did was instruct the Johnson government to seek an extension to the Brexit deadline. And the Johnson government said on at least 42 occasions in the press, and I know because I had to count them, uh, that it would not comply with this piece of legislation. Now, this is actually a perfect case for a junior, junior barrister, because I'd spent the last year going and getting injunctions against people who you know, wouldn't pay their rent or insisted on building things in places they weren't allowed to build them. Um, and actually, the principles were exactly the same, except for when we got to court, the Johnson government's lawyers said, oh, when we said in public that we weren't going to comply with this act, we were only joking. We didn't really mean it. And we, actually, we will comply with this act. And so we lost at first instance, and we went to appeal um, and said, essentially made the, uh, made the argument that when people tell you what they're going to do, you ought to believe them. Um, and the Court of Appeal, and this was, I should say, the Scots Court of Appeal, so this was the uh, inner house, um, agreed with us. And so it took the extraordinary step of saying this court will remain, um, will keep this case on foot and we will supervise the Prime Minister's compliance with this act. And if the, the Prime Minister does not comply in good time, you may come back and the court will sign the letter seeking an extension on the Prime Minister's behalf. And what's extraordinary about this case is that it was necessary at all, that you had a Prime Minister who felt able to say, I understand exactly what Parliament has asked me to do, I'm just not going to do it until forced. And that seems to bring us to the topic of the rule of law and the thrust of uh, this talk. Because when I initially started planning it, I thought I could call it Battles with Boris. Uh, but that seems a little bit wrong, actually, because while Johnson is portrayed as sort of uniquely mendacious, almost a cartoon villain for, um, for, for some, some of his opponents, in my view, he is merely a symptom rather than a cause, and he is part of a much longer term and continuing retrenchment from the, rule, the position of the rule of law and erosion of the rule of law in so much as it is an aspect of democracy. I'm going to make four points about that. Um, firstly, that we have seen an increase in the use of government by discretion rather than government through law. Second, we are seeing an erosion of fundamental rights, including human rights. 
Second, uh, third, I should say, we, are, we see a retrenchment and a limitation of access to justice. And fourth, uh, an increasing tendency not to comply, or at least to say we won't comply, with international law. Before I make those points, I want to dwell for just a moment on what the rule of law actually is, because it's not an entirely uncontested concept. Kofi Annan, the former United Nations General Secretary, described the rule of law as a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. It requires as well measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of the law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency. That's what's known as a thick definition of the rule of law. Um, not in a pejorative sense, I, I should, uh, should hasten, to, hasten to add, um, because the contrast is the thin uh, conception that is advanced by Joseph Raz and, and indeed Thomas Hobbes before him, um, that limits the rule of law to essentially a formal and procedural enterprise. Um, formally, it means that government is conducted by law rather than simply by fiat. Um, Procedurally, it means those laws are made in accordance with established and clear procedures. I find the thin definition quite problematic because it divorces law from its moral and social and political context. And anyone that has practiced law, I'm sure, will agree that 90% of what we're doing is not law, it's dealing with facts and it's dealing with people and the unique situations that people find themselves in. And if we try and t treat the law as some sort of antiseptic science, then you don't understand it properly, in my view. Um, moreover, uh, I think what Raz was talking about was not the rule of law, but rule by law. And these are very different things. Because the, rule, the law expects and requires uh, compliance, not compliance as a result merely of force, but compliance as a result of a degree of consent, and that in turn requires legitimacy. And so the thick conception, I believe, is preferable because it marries l the rule of law and democracy as two mutually essential and reinforcing concepts, both rooted in the acknowledgement that the individual has fundamental value in and of themselves. That's the rule of law. How has it been eroded? In my view, the rule of law has been, the erosion of the rule of law is part of the wider erosion of democracy in the UK. And in my book, I go, uh, there's only, in fact, one chapter on the rule of law, and most of it is about um, what I see as a turning back of the clock, not turning the UK into Russia or Hungary, but rather turning the UK back into an older and less democratic version of ourselves. And I set that picture out through eight cases that I've argued. I'm only going to focus on uh, today on one aspect of that, which is the rule of law. So turning to my uh, substantive argument, why do I say that the rule of law has been eroded? Well, first, we see an increase in government through discretion rather than through law. Um, why is that important? Because law is predictable and transparent. Discretion is not. Part of this, ironically, our erosion of the rule of law has been accomplished through law itself. And what I mean by this is a transition 
to government through statute to government through statutory instrument, from primary legislation to secondary legislation. And anyone who has tried uh, to bring the government to court will uh, know the difficulties that this creates. Primary, uh, primary legislation, the average number of uh, Acts of Parliament per year from 1950 to 2000 was 62. From 2000 to 2018, it was 33. Secondary legislation, from 1950 to 1990, the number of statutory instruments per year only crept above 2,500 on one occasion. From 2010 to 2019, the average was 3,000 per year. And so what we're seeing is government, uh, the law making itself being transferred from parliament to the executive and as a result, a substantial expansion of executive discretion. And the, the obvious example of these is the various Brexit acts, which um, were, were a sort of quantum change here, th there, because while previously, of course, it was not unheard of for primary legislation to include provisions for le secondary legislation, but these were always in specific and focused areas. The various Brexit Acts expanded these to allow the government to legislate through secondary legislation across the entirety of law and also by secondary legislation to uh, rescind and contradict primary legislation. We actually saw an example uh, of the problems that this causes today um, when the government doubled spending limits for the forthcoming uh, general election and did that by secondary legislation um, that was not scrutinised by Parliament at all. And so essentially we see a government making what is arguably a very political decision and giving itself a big political advantage in a way that is not scrutinised and that is essentially arbitrary. Second, we see an increase in discretion in the specific application of powers. Um, now, what we're taught in law school is we learn about conditions precedent, which say that where X, Y, and Z conditions are extant, then the following power is available to the minister. Now, we've seen a significant increase, however, in discretionary court clauses, which don't require X, Y, and Z to be extant, but rather require the minister to merely reasonably believe that X, Y, and Z are extant. Again, this is not a new invention. It's just used a lot more commonly. And moreover, for uh, more substantial and coercive legislation, an example is the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Bill, which uh, uh, gives ministers the power to authorise uh, government agents to commit crimes and to provide legal immunity for that. Um, in any situation, not confined to national security, but also in confined, uh, including things like the economic well-being of the UK, if the minister is of the opinion that it is necessary to do so for the economic well-being of the UK. Now, this puts the... Um, means the only way you can challenge that effectively is a Wensbury challenge. Um, and this brings me to the third aspect of this, which is... Um, where arguably in, at the beginning of the last decade we saw an increase in the proportionality standard, which is an objective and much more understandable standard being applied to uh, uh, ministerial decisions. And an example of that in legislation is, of course, the Equality Act. But you also saw decisions uh, like Unison, um, which said that where a fundamental right is at stake, the correct test is proportionality, not Wensbury reasonableness. Now, we've both reversed that in statute and in uh, the decisions of the Supreme Court. Um, in statute, the proportionality standard is just is simply not uh, used anymore. And Lord Reed in Begum essentially reversed himself um, 
and, and, and a, actually a series of cases that followed that, either uh, reversed or departed from what certainly my understanding of unison was and applied, rather than the proportionality standard to um, fundamental rights, applied a Wensbury standard uh, to questions of fundamental rights, therefore substantially expanding the discretion available to the decision maker. And I'm sure those in practice will know anyone who's tried to tr uh, challenge, mount a challenge on the Wensbury ground, it is uh, uh, rather difficult to succeed on, the, on that point. Second, human rights. Um, part of this is a anti-human rights discourse that in my view is, uh, is based uh, largely on misunderstanding or perhaps deliberate misrepresentation. Uh, we see human rights regularly set up as, say, human rights versus democracy. Um, and this is, I think, to misunderstand democracy, really, because democracy itself flows from this essential recognition and protection of the value of the person. The human rights are what guarantees that. You have the rights, uh, the human rights guarantee, for example, the right to vote. Democracy is much more than simply rocking up every five years or whenever the government deigns to have an election and putting a cross in a box. Democracy is an entire system of government. Second, we, uh, we often contrast a foreign court with domestic courts, and human rights is seen as a foreign imposition uh, on the UK. Um, well, of course, it's not, because the European Convention was largely drafted by David Maxwell Fife, who was a British lawyer. But even if, it, even if that were not the case, it fundamentally misrepresents the nature of human rights. Um, I was uh, actually on doing moral maze of, of all things and I, uh, uh, about human rights, and, and the question that I put was, you say, if you say that British people... Um, shouldn't be it shouldn't benefit from the European Convention of Human Rights on Human Rights I should say um, are you suggesting that we are less human than French people than German people are you suggesting that we are differently human if you recognize that the human is entitled to certain basic rights certain lines over which the state cannot step then it is fundamentally illogical to try and draw differences between different humans. And of course, um, we're told that human rights only protect people that we don't like, um, uh, which I think is simply subjective. It really rather depends on who you like. Um, but it also misses the point um, for the reasons that I've already set out. Um, we've seen attempts to remove the uh, the Human Rights Act and therefore the tie that binds us in domestic law to the European Convention through the Bill of Rights Bill, uh, that of course failed. But what we're seeing now is the Bill of Rights Bill essentially, I can't believe they called it that, incidentally. It is the worst named piece of legislation um, since anything to do with levelling up. Um, the what that we were seeing is the Bill of Rights Bill being sort of chopped up and added to different pieces of legislation and therefore uh, disagreeing with it in dissent and uh, arguing against it becomes much more difficult. Uh, an example of that is the Illegal Migration Act, which um, provides, uh, pro prohibits essentially human rights challenges uh, to immigration decisions um, until after deportation. And this is... Um, certainly in the, the view of a, a number of international organizations and in the view of me, um, contrary to uh, international law. And of course, we see it in our response, uh, the government's response to uh, the Rwanda decision. Um, Suella Breverman suggesting that human rights challenges are banned completely. Lee Anderson suggesting that we simply ignore human rights. And Rishi Sunak uh, uh, saying that he won't allow a foreign court uh, to block the plan, um, conveniently forgetting that the court that blocked the plan is 100 metres away from his office. Number third, access to justice. This is important because the law is pretty pointless if you can't use it. The law should be a great leveller. And the reason I 
wanted to be a barrister is because the way I see it working is that when you step into a court, whether you are the king or whether you are, um, I know me, you have an equal chance, an equal shot to win the argument. And what matters is who is right on the facts and on the law. But that only works when both sides have great solicitors and competent advocates. And government has legislated to ensure that that is no longer the case. And this legislation predates uh, the Johnson government quite substantially. Um, begins, in fact, with uh, um, the Thatcher administration and continues through the Blair and Cameron administration. And that's cuts to legal aid. When legal aid was uh, first put in place by the Apley government, it covered 80% of the population. Now it covers about 10. Um, nowhere has it been cut back more than in relation to challenges to the government itself, where legal aid is now only available if you are on means-tested state benefits. And this means that the vast majority of people in the UK cannot, in practice, challenge the government if the government breaks the law. We've also seen, particularly in judicial review, um, a massive expansion of costs and costs liability. And I can't put this any better than, than Tom Hickman did. And he, Tom Hickman, who's one of the, our leading public lawyers, uh, was, was so exercised about this, he wrote not one, but three blogs on the, uh, the, um, UK, Human Right, uh, the UK Constitutional Law Society uh, page, setting out all of the many different ways in which cost risk has increased and deters people. Um, one of my first JR cases was for a, a community group in Pembrokeshire, um, which was JRing the, um, the grant of planning uh, permission for a budget hotel, uh, which was assessed to seriously impact on the, the local economy. Um, we had a, a decent case. I, I don't know if we had a, a winning case or not, because the group decided they couldn't take the case any further, even though I advised that it was perfectly arguable. And that's because even when you put in place cost protection, um, which would have limited their liability to about £5,000, these were not people who had £5,000 kicking about. These were not people who could take that risk. Um, the other aspect of access to justice is, of course, the attitude of ministers to the legal system and the judicial system itself. Um, I could repeat for a long time claims of activist lawyers, enemies of the people, but I want to make very clear um, that this didn't end with the end of the Johnson government. This didn't end with the Sunak, the grown-up, coming into power because one of the first things that he said when he started campaigning for the job was to threaten to crack down on, in his words, recalcitrant judges. And by that he meant judges who made decisions that he didn't like. I acted as counsel last year to a parliamentary inquiry into uh, the independence of the judiciary. And that inquiry concluded, and it was a cross-party um, inquiry, it concluded that ministers had acted unconstitutionally in putting pressure, the, ex the level of pressure that they had attempted to exert on judges. Now, certainly I do not here suggest that judges are making different decisions because they're scared of ministers. And I have not come across a judge who I would could ever in a million years imagine um, doing that. Um, but nonetheless, it is inappropriate and it runs contrary to the rule of law. Fourth is adherence to international law. Um, I'm sure I don't have to recap the, uh, the dualist principle. Um, to you, maybe, but I think I probably would have to recap the dualist principle if I was giving this lecture in front of an audience of politicians, um, because it seems to not be understood. Um, the executive seems to have proceeded on the basis that because Parliament is sovereign domestically, Parliament is entitled to um, legislate contrary to international law. And in terms of 
the four walls of the United Kingdom. It's not completely wrong. But international law doesn't really matter that much within the four walls of the, the United Kingdom. Certainly, the people that are going to be most annoyed if you break it are all outside the four walls of the United Kingdom. And the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, it is essential that we operate an international rules-based order and that uh, leading nations, as the UK still at least purports to be, upholds that rules-based order. More importantly, perhaps, if you want to take a kind of political realist approach to this, if the UK doesn't abide by the agreements that it has made under international law, and that's what international law is, a series of agreements between countries, then countries are less likely to make agreements with us. And that, I think, under any uh, set of the imagination is uh, not great foreign policy. Some examples of this, of course, we have uh, Northern Ireland and the Internal Markets Bill, um, where we were set to breach international law in a specific and limited uh, way. Um, the sort of remind me, of, I was cross-examining a, um, a witness yesterday, and uh, I, uh, after, after a bit of a monologue, I said, that was very interesting. Could you possibly tell me what the answer to my question is, please? Um, and he said, oh, um, what was your question? Um, and I had to remind him that if, if by the time you finish speaking you've forgotten what the question is, you probably haven't answered it. Um, if you find yourself saying, I'm going to break international law in a specific and limited way, you're probably breaking international law. Um, that, uh, of course, provoked an incredible reaction, very serious reaction, um, uh, outside the UK, and something that we, we don't, our press often doesn't cover, but if you read the American press, the Australian press, the French press, um, the reaction was much more severe than was reported in the, in the UK. Um, it, what, in the end, it didn't happen, but we're now seeing the spectre being raised again in relation to Rwanda. Um, in all, every version of the plan, and I think uh, Michael and I will get into talking about the, the various uh, specific problems with the, uh, the, the different responses to the Rwanda judgment, that every version of that plan involves uh, finding a way to accept a higher level of risk of refoulement than is acceptable under international law. So every version of that plan involves breaching the refugee conventions, um, the Refugee Convention of 1951, the Protocol of 1967, and indeed our own domestic law, which applies those, which are the Immigration Acts of 1993, 2002, and 2004. You would have thought them being this old, the government would have a chance to, had a chance to get to grips with them by this point. So we are now barreling towards a, another breach, or certainly another threatened breach, of international law, um, and that is particularly worrying. To close then, um, the rule of law is not an abstract idea. It is a very practical, everyday issue. And just to give you an example of this, I was, um, again, breaking my News UK uh, uh, duck um, at the weekend on, um, uh, on, on Talk TV, and uh, I pointed out to... Um, uh, to the presenter who, um, who was started off very, very in, in favour of uh, the Suella Braverman Rwanda plan. I pointed out that uh, what she proposes to do is essentially cut off every avenue of legal challenge. And that would mean uh, that if he were deported to Rwanda, despite being a citizen of the UK, but by some case of mistaken identity or maliciousness or just a series of unfortunate events, if he were deported to Rwanda, there is nothing that he would be able to do about it. Um, and he actually, to his credit, said, never thought of it like that. I'm now a lot less in favour of this plan. Um, but that's what I mean. The rule of law is practical. It's every day. It's not something that's just for abstract theoretical debates between Joseph Raz and uh, Tom Bingham. It's for every day and it's for essential for lawyers to make the case for it all of the time. Thanks very much. Thank you.